77 years ago, on August 6th, 1945, at 8.15 in the morning, a new sun appeared in the skies over Hiroshima. The force from which the sun draws its power has been loosed against those who brought war to the Far East. The United States had unleashed the first atomic bomb on a city in history. Little Boy detonated some 600 meters in the air. Everything within a mile of the hypocenter was instantly vaporized. Cloth, wood, glass, flesh, and bone. There was no time to scream, your lungs were full of fire. The shockwave to follow traveled faster than sound and atomized all it could for many miles more. The radiation infected everything, even the rain. It had a white center surrounded with burning silver. It was a pale light, like a photo flash. I blacked out. I tried to stand up and saw my classmate's mother had been blown to the opposite side of the car road. She was completely black. Her pants were in tatters. In her charred face, just two white eyes were wide open and staring at me. There, a long procession of ghosts passed in front of me. Their arms were crooked and hanging, the skin of each arm peeled off and hanging from the fingernails. Of Hayao Miyazaki's 14 Studio Ghibli films so far, almost a third explicitly feature the development and devastation of atomic-like or other devastating weapons of war. Over half examined the ugly lead up to and aftermath of war itself, even explicitly referencing World War II. This is no coincidence. Miyazaki's first memories were of bombed out cities, and he has spoken repeatedly of the impact those days have had on his art and him psychologically. Even though it should have been midnight, outside it was bright red and maybe pink. The streets we passed along were burning, right down to the sides of the road. A woman carrying a little girl was running towards us saying, please, please let us on, but the car just went on going. Though not made by Miyazaki, this recalls the painful imagery of Studio Ghibli's Grave of the Fireflies, as the brother and sister trick through the fiery ruins, civilians selfishly refusing to help each other in their suffering. But more than that, the bomb, be it firebombing or the atomic bomb, has had a profound effect on the Japanese cultural memory, and it comes out in the stories they tell over and over. Godzilla has been reimagined as nuclear fallout, Akira's iconic nuclear imagery, and here in Miyazaki's films where all the super weapons share something in common. It is always death from the skies. In Castle in the Sky, a weapon is unleashed with imagery which can only be described as that of an atomic bomb. More than that, it's loosed from what is literally a flying fortress, the common name for the B-29 bomber which dropped a little boy on Hiroshima. He even describes the core of Laputa as something like a nuclear reactor. The Wind Rises tells the story of the development of the Mitsubishi Zero Fighter, which dominated the skies and was one of the most deadly weapons of the Second World War, killing thousands. While Nausicaa in the Valley of the Wind, Miyazaki's first film and based on his own 1982 comic, features a monolithic superweapon fired down from on high with, again, imagery which can only be described as what they must have seen in Hiroshima that morning. It leaves the world irradiated, sick, and the natural world devastated. See, radiation and bodily mutations which stem from it have had just as much a place in Japanese storytelling imagery as the bomb itself. They are both deeply rooted in the cultural memory. See, Japan never faced the grueling tank and infantry battles on their homeland that much the rest of Asia and Europe did. No, they capitulated long before that. Meaning instead, for most people, their memory of what they call the Pacific War is instead dominated by the unceasing firebombing campaigns and the two atomic bomb drops. Death from the skies. In Howl's Moving Castle, though we see navies and tanks and infantry marching off to war, it's the firebombing of these monstrous, shadowy ships like metallic Lovecraftian creatures of the sky that the story focuses on, that Sophie and Howl face directly. This is the ultimate source of destruction in the narrative, and the focus of its pointless violence. 
The fire bombings of Tokyo alone killed up to 130,000 people, three times that of the infamous bombing of Dresden and the most deadly fire bombing campaign in history. However, this imagery is equally applicable to the aftermath of the Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombings. It draws heavily on the accounts of those who survived them. While the initial flash, the same temperature as the surface of the sun, killed tens of thousands instantly, it was the fires that followed which killed even more. Children on their way to school, babies crying for their mothers suddenly silenced. One victim was sitting on the steps outside their house only 260 meters from the hypocenter when they were reduced to nothing so instantly that all they left behind was a shadow of where they sat in the stone. The rest of the rock bleached of color in the heat. And then it got worse. The explosion sparked a firestorm over the city. The flames were so intense, so high and wide, louder than any emergency siren could have ever been that morning, they dragged in the air from all around, creating a fierce wind towards the firestorm, dragging the flames a hundred meters in the air, and it's the fire, not the flash, that people kept returning to in their accounts. As the tremendous pillar of fire whirled higher, the debris it sucked in sparkled in the sunlight, at once horrifying and unspeakably beautiful. On this clear midsummer day, that mushroom was the only cloud in the sky. Here and there, rays of sunlight broke through. The flames chased them as they fled, burned and blood covered in the devastating furnace. Fires spread unchecked by rivers and the aftermath looked like nothing but hell. It's no wonder that when presented with the giant warrior from Nausicaa, they are marching over a field of fire, of melting buildings. That in Howl's Moving Castle, we watch whole cities being burned to the ground from up on high, houses being rent in two by the bombs. Destruction and death in Miyazaki's films are deeply connected with the uncontrollable threat from above, especially airplanes. His latest film, How Do You Live, is set in 1943 during World War II and opens with Mahiti Maki's mother, Hisako, being killed in an air raid on Tokyo. Again, while not made by Miyazaki, this is also overtly captured in Studio Ghibli's other film, Grave of the Fireflies, which directly follows two siblings struggling to survive during the fire bombings of the last days of the war. When you understand how devastating the fire bombings were, it's no surprise that they're placed on equal footing to the atomic bombs. But Miyazaki's super weapons aren't just defined by symbolically similar imagery. In Howl's Moving Castle, Howl struggles to control his physical form, resisting turning into a monster of the sky. In one brief scene, we see him tearing a ship apart, a huge, deadly creature with eyes not unlike those of the giant warriors. In Nausicaa, the giant warrior superweapons are falling apart as they're ordered to fire, only vaguely going off in the direction instructed. In Lapita Castle in the Sky, the characters unleash the superweapon out of a desire for power, but don't know how it works or control its magnitude. It is just raw power incarnate. In The Wind Rises, Jiro exercises precise mathematical control over the Zero Plane's exact features and weapons but not how it is used. That question belongs to the military. For all his creative control, it is a weapon out of his hands. So when Sophie asks how where the warships are going, Hal simply says to bomb cities and kill people. Death from the skies, wherever it appears in Miyazaki's work, is indiscriminate. Over and over, Miyazaki returns to this illusion of control we have over these weapons. In each of these films, the super weapon is something a character thinks they can control, that they understand that belongs to them. They believe they can refine the violence, but it is inevitably beyond them. One of the defining factors in illegal weapons of war these days is indiscriminate targeting. Weapons which blur the line between military and civilian targets. And to understand what this really means in the context of these weapons, while 200,000 or so died in the Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombings, under a tenth of those were military personnel. 
It's for this same reason weapons like cluster bombs, which break apart into smaller munitions, often over wide, indiscriminate areas, have otherwise been banned and are so controversial. We cannot control where the radiation goes, which children die of cancer too early, which water systems are poisoned for generations to come, which hospitals burn up in the inferno. In fact, Little Boy itself detonated over 200 meters from its intended target. But perhaps more profoundly, Miyazaki's films expose the true nature of these superweapons. They're us. They've always been us. The image of the giant warrior, a humanoid form but distinctly inhuman, with soulless eyes marching on, their flesh melting as they fire, their skeleton exposed. I can't stop thinking about the opening to The Wind Rises, where Jiro sees a German bomber plane appear overhead, and the bombs are framed as living, breathing, convulsing things. And on closer inspection, they are these dark, humanoid creatures with again soulless pits for eyes, that same imagery, falling from the sky. Howl is paralleled with the bomber planes multiple times, B-29s in particular, and the more he becomes this demonic creature, the more we see them. We hide behind machines and weapons, we put distance between ourselves and the suffering, but it's us. It's always been us the ugliest form of humanity. One of my favourite scenes in all of Studio Ghibli's work is when Howell is discussing how witches and wizards can eventually be stuck in the form of these deadly, ugly, flying creatures if they stay in them too long, this form being used in the war. Kelsifer jokes that they'll cry about it when they can't turn back, but Howell, a wizard himself who is prone to these desires, says, no. They will simply forget they ever knew how to cry. See, the more we use deadlier superweapons of our own, the more accustomed we will become to their violence, to it being quote, necessary and just the way war is. It removes accountability and blame. And we already see this in the way a lot of people look back on the atomic bombings and excuse them now. Oh, it was just the way war was. Oh, it was necessary. This is not the place to discuss how it hasn't been proven that it was absolutely necessary, but Miyazaki spends a lot of time in his memoir book, Turning Points, speaking to violence as an inherent part of human nature, and lamenting how aircraft and technology have made that more difficult to control. The history of aircraft is mercilessness itself. Is our mercilessness an attribute of ours we cannot control? At times, I wonder if we should start thinking seriously about banning the use of manned and unmanned aircraft in war. This is something Miyazaki actually has in common with J.R. Tolkien. Both saw these weapons as exacerbating our worst instincts, our mercilessness, bringing them to the surface and making it easier to commit horrific acts by placing distance between us and the destruction we cause. This is the exact struggle Ashitaka faces in Princess Mononoke, the curse growing in power with his hatred, his mercilessness. Can we as humans really control our egos? I have no faith in that. Human beings are irredeemable. We are truly irredeemable. And that is why we keep devouring this planet of ours. It's easier when you don't have to look your enemy in the face, when you don't hear them howl in agony, when they're a pixel on a screen, when they're just a target down below. Which is why Miyazaki goes to such lengths to bring his characters face to face with those they harm. We know ordinary people can commit acts of great cruelty. After all, under abnormal conditions, this is surely one of the hallmarks of ordinary people. In discussing Princess Mononoke in his book, Miyazaki points out how people in the ironworks are kind and equitable, but when San breaks in, they become brutal, even cruel. This motif of the ordinary person committing horrific acts turns up repeatedly in Ghibli films. In Nausicaa, a nameless soldier wipes out the city of Peugeot to destroy a military target, killing everyone else in the process too. And while different sides fight over who should control the giant warrior, they insist it's about saving the world and rebuilding it. It's just echoes of that necessary and just the way war is. 
It feels oxymoronic even to present such a destructive force as something that can save and rebuild. It feels ridiculous even, and the story presents it as just that. The Wind Rises features one of Miyazaki's most ordinary protagonists, an engineer who dreams of creating incredible flying machines, creating something beautiful, and he's tasked with creating a weapon of war which will kill thousands. The central question of this film is, I wonder which is greater, what we gained in making airplanes or what we lost due to them, this being a reference to both the firebombing and atomic weaponry, and it's a sentiment echoed almost word for word in Miyazaki's own memoirs. Over and over, these films explore the line of thinking the ordinary person goes through to justifying using super weapons for themselves, because there is a greater evil for the science of it, out of social group loyalty. Perhaps the only unambiguously evil character in all of his work is Muska from Lapita Castle in the Sky, who uses the super weapon with glee out of a ruthless desire for power. And when we think about ordinary people, it's important to remember that they were the ones behind the atomic bomb droppings in the first place. Colonel Paul Warfield Tibbetts Jr., an ordinary guy who flew the Enola Gay to Hiroshima that morning. He grew up with a love and passion for aeroplanes and defended his actions till the day he died. In a way, he's not that dissimilar to Miyazaki himself. Then there's Truman, who ended up in the top job somewhat accidentally. At some point along the way, these people forgot how to cry. All of this perpetuates a spiral of violence that justifies worse and worse superweapons for more and more ordinary reasons. Outside the Hiroshima Museum is the Peace Flame, which has been going since 1964. And it's sworn to burn till there are no nuclear weapons left on Earth. But more than that, it's a reminder. A reminder that we must not forget how to cry. Truth is, I don't think I've ever been so affected by a piece of art as when I walked through that Hiroshima Peace Museum memorial and saw the hundreds of works done by survivors of the atomic bombings. Unforgettably real in a way that other art has rarely ever come close to, seared into my memory on the deepest levels in a way that I can only hope I never forget. And their words, I can't stop thinking about them. At that instant, I saw a light like a rainbow. The city's rivers were full of such dying people. One Piece by Kichisuke Yoshimura, 18 at the time, has stuck with me ever since the day I saw it. I saw figures that seemed to be from another world, ghost-like, their hair falling over their faces, their clothes ripped to shreds, their skin hanging. There's a unique kind of body horror here, in this dripping, abstract painting he left behind. You get the sense of raw flesh of every part of their bodies burning, the agony. The lack of definition leaves all the room to imagine what it must have been like, because no amount of detail could really tell us. Red, yellow, and green, all the colors flesh should not be. It, it makes it deeply uncomfortable just to look at for me. Something human taken from them. And I couldn't help but recall the imagery of the melting warrior from Norsica in the Valley of the Wind. Its flesh falling off its exposed skeleton. The way it drags itself about in constant agony. Perhaps the most recurring image aside from the fire in their drawings was melting flesh. I wish I could take you through the hundreds of drawings they had, each with its own story, capturing some small part of that indiscriminate devastation. People throwing themselves into the water to cool themselves, whole cisterns of dead bodies, the river choked with lives lost. The drowned bodies were swollen like balloons, their gender undeterminable. They floated in the water completely naked, their skin dyed multiple colours. I'm reminded of one survivor's account. Hiroshima had become three coloured, red, black, and brown. Before me were smashed human bodies, bleeding heads and stomachs torn open, just like the pictures of hell. 
the only difference from the pictures of hell was there was no greenery at all in Hiroshima, and everyone was crying and screaming. But we can't go through every picture. I can only say go see it for yourself. It's impossible not to draw connections between these descriptions and how Ghibli captures war and the effects of these weapons. The colour palette of the atomic and firebombing scenes are built from red, black and brown, burning away everything else. Even though we see armies in these films full of colour and life and vibrant flags and cheerful music, whenever the violence is brought home, it's done so with this dim colour palette, a reality brought home and made red, brown and black with it. And yet, flying machines are also the object of beauty in Miyazaki's films. In virtually every single film, the main characters fly in some way, shape or form, and it's a wondrous experience full of freedom and beauty. Porco Rosso has this beautiful shot early on of his seaplane in the golden light of sunset, caught between the dark and the light. There's this tension always in his films between the beauty of flight and the devastation it has brought upon the world. To the generals, he writes, aircraft were reserves of military capacity. To the manufacturing industrialists, they were pure profit. And to the young men who flew them, they were a chance for glorious fame and excitement. It's because of this horror that both the Hiroshima Peace Museum and Miyazaki seem to share the same position on nuclear weapons. They must be eradicated. There is no middle ground. There are always ordinary people with ordinary justifications. But these are extraordinary weapons with no extraordinary justifications for what we hear in those accounts. The all-powerful civilization of Laputa gave up their godlike nuclear powers willingly. When the superweapon is destroyed at the end of the film, Laputa ascends into the heavens and out of humanity's reach. The godlike warriors of Nausicaa are destroyed or they destroy themselves. In each of these cases, peace is accomplished when the threat itself is removed. Abolition. Built into this is Miyazaki's famous environmentalism, though perhaps a little more subtly. One of the most poignant moments in all of Miyazaki's work comes in the confrontation between Shita and Muska in Laputa Castle in the Sky. This is why Laputa died out, she said. There's a song in my valley that explains everything. Put down your roots in the soil, live together with the wind, pass the winter with the seeds, sing in the spring with the birds. Your weapons may be powerful, your pitiful robots may be numerous, but you cannot survive away from the earth. The all-powerful civilization of Laputa attained great power by leaving the earth behind, but they realized they needed the earth more. Nuclear weapons are unique in their radiation poisoning, which can turn whole regions uninhabitable, not just for humans, but life itself. The fear that trees and grass will never grow appears over and over in the accounts of survivors. Their drawings often narrow in on the greenery which survived and where it didn't. It's only in destroying the soup weapon beneath Laputa that the tree roots at the heart of the city are freed, while in Nausicaa the giant warrior is turned against the Omu and the dark forest of nature, which is just trying to defend itself and heal from humanity. The beauty of the natural world, not as a setting but as a character in its own right, beautiful and terrifying at the same time, is a recurring theme in Ghibli's work. These superweapons are not merely existential threats but ecological ones. And a discussion that only focuses on human suffering is an incomplete one. This video was originally meant to be a breakdown of the Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombings in the same way as I did with Unit 731, but that's not going to happen this video. Instead, I wanted to focus on Ghibli's relationship with the atomic bomb and war because there is a problem with Japanese storytelling here. Since the Second World War, Japan has developed a rich history of stories which abhor the horrors of war, especially nuclear warfare painting it as pointless and rational and existentially threatening and warning of the fears of radiation. Grave of the Fireflies is one of the most harrowing depictions of wartime suffering ever made because of how effectively it highlights the apathy and distance that war like this produces. 
Japan's own foreign policy since the Second World War has been markedly anti-interventionist and anti-war in general. Their constitution famously prohibits them from owning certain types of offensive weapons or waging any aggressive war. The right of the belligerency of the state will not be recognized. Since 1951, Japan has officially only participated in one real conflict in any aggressive capacity, and that was against Somali pirates. Miyazaki has made no secret of his hatred for war and the need for honesty in depicting it. In criticizing Tales of a Street Corner, a 1962 short film, Miyazaki said, It's almost as if Tezuka avoided depicting a nuclear war just so the girl could survive. The only correct approach would have been to show the little girl's death was completely meaningless. In Nausicaa, in Castle in the Sky, and in Howl's Moving Castle, the justifications for using such super weapons and firebombing are portrayed as pitiful excuses for violence which even his child characters can see through. Militarism and apocalyptic desire are revealed as untenable, and their traumatic experiences cause the characters to reject their military roles in favour of safety and seclusion. We see this play out in the stories of Howl, of Asbel, and Jero, each of whom are drawn into a military with apocalyptic ideas, but instead choose to go into seclusion. The war in Howl's Moving Castle has at best a vague cause and is almost cartoonishly called off at the end of the film in such a way as to reveal how pointless and unnecessary it was in the first place, especially when pitted against the raw destruction we otherwise see. That the main reason people go to war are not these pithy excuses we see, but patriotism, nationalism, and conquest. Everything else is an excuse. Where violence is explored more neutrally, as in Princess Mononoke, it's done as an attribute of human existence and experience that must be acknowledged and managed. And yet, despite Japan's consistent anti-war narratives, this often means they end up positioning Japan as the victims of the Second World War, erasing or ignoring their role in starting it and waging it. See, I'm here in Aotearoa, New Zealand at a coastal defence battery. These were built in 1939 at the outbreak of the European theatre because people here feared that Japan would come to our coasts and conquer New Zealand as well. There were two six inch long range artillery pieces built here and over there to ward off any potential attack. At the height of their use it was staffed by over 400 people. Of course the war never came here, realistically it never would. But Japan did bring war to over a billion people around the world, suffering genocide and torture as one of the most brutal empires the world had ever seen. And yet this legacy is often ignored in Japanese media. In mainstream Japanese World War II films, the protagonist is often an ordinary person that is a victim of the war's circumstances and who struggles to survive the tragedy of the war while not focusing on the political causes of the war. These films are pacifistic and anti-responsibility. One thing which struck me at the Hiroshima Peace Museum was that the only real admission of guilt was the phrase, there was a time when Japan walked the path of war. The problem being that yes, they were the victims of the firebombing campaigns or the atomic bombings, but they were not the victims of the wider prosecution of the war. And this depiction dishonestly places the Japanese people on equal footing as that of their victims, instead framing war as a terrible consequence of the irrational decisions of people on both sides. Japan has a long history of denial or at best a shaky relationship with acknowledging and admitting what happened during the Second World War, in sharp contrast to a place like Germany. And Miyazaki's films are not immune to this problem either. While The Wind Rises ends on the familiar poignant note about the futility of war and the suffering atomic bombs bring, with the naval officers in the film portrayed as childish, arguing over nothing, raising complaints and petty disputes, the film has been criticised for lionising the creator of one of the most potent symbols of Japanese military militarism, the Zero Fighter Plane. While Jiro considers the war foolish and suffers some guilt over building weapons of war, that guilt is centred on how Japan brought destruction upon itself, and not broader responsibility for waging the war. 
the suffering of the victims of other countries. In one interview, Miyazaki spoke of the Zero Plane in saying, quote, The Zero represented one of the few things we Japanese could be proud of. They were a truly formidable presence, and so were the pilots who flew them. While you can understand it from a purely engineering view, this sort of sentiment wouldn't fly if a German filmmaker said something similar of the Nazi Panzer IV tank, an equally innovative piece of wartime technology, but also a symbol of genocidal terror. It begs the question, is this really the right angle to take given the context it exists in? Christopher Nolan's Oppenheimer faces a critically similar issue here narratively, and I can't tell you at the time of filming this how he handles this question, but it tells the story of the genius scientist behind the very atom bomb which would one day be dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, an item of incredible innovation, even art from the perspective of someone focused on the science and distant from how it's used on the battlefield. And yet, there is Oppenheimer's famous line. I remembered the line from the Hindu scripture, the Bhagavad Gita. Vishnu is trying to persuade the prince that he should do his duty and to impress him takes on his multi-armed form and says, now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. To what degree will Oppenheimer grapple with the responsibility this man has for what happened in Hiroshima and Nagasaki? I don't know. The man famously regretted his role as the father of the atomic bomb and the Cold War world he created. But in both Oppenheimer and The Wind Rises, we have this tension between the science and engineering as an art form, beautiful in its own way, but also terrible and twisted. Yet at the same time, Miyazaki repeatedly places blame for wartime suffering on nationalism, proto-fascism, insecurity, and deluded ambitions that you can make the world a better place by using these terrible weapons at all. While his films do not name Japan, they do condemn the ideology that drove them. He calls out Japan, if indirectly, while those who use superweapons like the giant warrior and the castle in the sky are portrayed as antagonists, their victims are not always blameless nor helpless and are often perpetrators of equally terrible violence themselves. Grave of the Fireflies, while again not made by Miyazaki, definitely fits in with this ethos and was made by his lifelong friend who shared a similar worldview, Isao Takahata. In a paper by Wendy Goldberg, Transcending the Victim's History, she writes, Grave is critical of the blind patriotism that makes selfish impulses during the war and, afterward, Japan's inability to confront this past. Throughout the film, Sata dreams of revenge and this national fantasy of war. The same blind proto-fascism we see in this child is also the cause of the war. He and his sister are two sides of the same coin, Japan as perpetrator, Japan as victim, particularly of the bombings. But the truth is, as I was researching for this video, watching all these films, reflecting on the art, I kept coming back to a 1937 book by Genzaburo Yoshino called How Do You Live? It's a book that Miyazaki talks a lot about, and in fact his last film, released just recently, is named after it. Though it's not available for me to watch yet, it too features the Second World War and death from above, with the main character's mother dying in the fire bombings at the start of the film. Because understanding this book really helps explain how Miyazaki deals with these weapons in his films. The book is about a child learning to be the best person they can in an increasingly complicated world, and even an outright evil one, and yet still choosing to be good. Miyazaki highlighted how it was published during a time of ideological and academic oppression, of racial nationalism and suicidal patriotism sending the country towards catastrophe. And this is also when his film is set as well. How do you be a good person in a world like that? When it comes to resisting wars, I dislike the overly fanatic approach of groups like the White Rose Society. I prefer the type of people the British children's writer Robert Westall wrote about. Sent off to war, they try to live with as much humanity as they can, and, even though they exhaust themselves, still attempt to live. I don't want to make films that support killing and being killed. 
The White Rose was one of the few real resistance groups inside Nazi Germany, virtually all its members of whom were arrested and eventually executed, though it was, oddly enough, a non-violent group. This is not Miyazaki saying there is no space for the violent resistance of a few, but that he believes people acting with humanity to those immediately around them consistently on a daily basis in the ordinary spaces and in extraordinary times is the best people can often do. It's a kind of resistance in its own right. This makes a lot of sense of how Studio Ghibli's films deal with these super weapons and war more broadly. The problem of these weapons is rarely solved with great displays of power, but instead the choices of the ordinary person to love, to care, to listen, to retain their humanity. This is the case with Howl choosing Sophie, with Nausicaa choosing to save the baby Omu, with Sheeta connecting with the giant robots, and in a fascinating difference in the comic as opposed to the film, the giant warrior, the super weapon in Nausicaa, actually sacrifices itself to save her, asking in its last moments if it was finally a good person. Just like these films explore how ordinary people can do horrific things for ordinary reasons, how these justifications lead us to things like Hiroshima and Nagasaki, they also show us how ordinary people prevent these horrors by acting with humanity. The Wind Rises makes a lot more sense in this context. Jiro almost asks himself repeatedly throughout the film, how do I live? And he doesn't necessarily succeed, he doesn't always choose right. He can get a bit lost in it. It depicts the struggle, but is ambiguous in a way. This is the question, too, at the center of his latest film. I don't know if I agree with this way of thinking, but it's certainly a persuasive angle to Miyazaki's work. Ghibli's stories continue to be a living memorial to the futility of war, and a nuanced warning not only of the horrors of nuclear weapons, but of the ordinary people and ordinary reasons that lead to using them. So let's remember when that second sun appeared in the skies over Hiroshima. Let's remember the 200,000 dead. Let us remember how to cry. And perhaps Miyazaki is right. If we want to stop something like this ever happening again, we need to ask ourselves, how do we live?